We're good. Good morning. Let me begin by telling you a tale that you may or may not believe. A long time ago and very, very far away, it used to be that church began whether or not any kind of electronic stuff was working because we didn't use it. I just used to stand up and talk to people without a microphone or anything else. It was amazing before it got as easy as it is today. How are you today? Good, I hope. I am filling in for Kelly, so uh, that'll be interesting. And I'm going to go through our announcements here uh, uh, one by one on the page because I am forgetful. So here we go. Are, are you ready to listen? Come on. Beautiful morning. Let's enjoy it. So welcome to the Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad you chose to worship with us. We hope you enjoy your experience this morning. And we invite you to join us in our mission, Growing Disciples and Loving Our Community for Christ. We'll be talking about that a lot today. Uh, we would like to know that you're worshiping with us if you're on Facebook or uh, other stuff by texting the word here to 559-657-6848, 559-657-6848, text the word here. If you would like to support our ministries by giving, we have several options for your convenience. Online giving, uh, you can visit our website, visaliamethodist.org, and click the Giving tab, or you may mail your offering to P.O. Box 7360, Visalia 93290, and we thank you in advance for your generosity. Care Ministries are offering three programs online this fall. There is Grief Share, there is Divorce Care, and there is Financial Peace. We've already talked a great deal about grief share and divorce care. Financial peace could be one of the most significant decisions you would ever make in your life because if you can gain control of your finances and find peace in that part of your life, you can certainly um, make for your own, own self a, a life of more peace. Recordings of today's service will be posted on our website, YouTube, and Facebook. Be sure to share it with your friends and family, and please don't forget to like and follow us on Facebook. That's all the announcements that I have. You know that Marilyn is a pastor in Three Rivers, California, and that a part of the Three Rivers community was evacuated because of the fires uh, this week. The report that she received this morning is that they um, they were able to do whatever they call them, back fires, so, so they, they burned ground so the fire wouldn't be able to feed its way through. And it looks like it's good news up there as of this morning at about 7 o'clock. We hope so. Uh, please continue to keep firefighters and uh, other folks who have been evacuated in your prayers. It's lovely to see blue sky and to be able to take a deep breath of air this morning, so I, I hope you'll enjoy that also. If you will rise now, I'll read uh, Scripture and pray us into the worship service. This is from Psalm 46, the first section of that psalm. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of Scripture. Will you bow your heads for a, a word of opening prayer? Father, we give uh, thanks to you for this beautiful day and, and for good company to keep the day with. We ask that you would bless us during this worship service that we might feel the nudge of your Holy Spirit as we listen to Scripture and think together about how to apply it to our lives. We lift up for your blessing those who are affected by the fires, either because they're in the way of the fire or because they are fighting it or their loved ones are. And we ask that in uh, every instance that folks might be able to feel your presence and your comfort as they continue uh, those battles. Bless the leaders who make decisions on what is best for our national forests and, and how to take care of uh, the areas that have, have burned and may burn in the future, that they can be wise in their considerations. We thank you for the gift of the community of church and our ability to gather together in your spirit this morning. And we ask that you truly would bless us that we might receive your word. It's in the name of your son that we pray. Amen. Okay, please enjoy worship. Good morning, everybody. How are you all doing this morning? Blessed? Good? Praise be to God. Well, if you would like to stand, stand up. We're going to praise God this morning. If you'd like to stay seated, that's totally fine. But I want to ask you all this question. Who here believes that they are a friend of God? Amen. So let's just give glory to God because we are his friends. Amen. true 
have this time now to just worship God. If you feel like raising your hands, you can raise your hands. If not, if you just want to close your eyes and just meditate on his goodness, then whatever you feel in your heart to do, because right now we're just going to glorify God and just, just let him know that he is worthy. Amen. So the next song that we're going to sing right now is called Worthy as the Lamb. So let's continue. sin and 
Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you. Please be seated. The original idea that I had many, many, many years ago was that we would use our garage as half place to park the car and half place to work the wood. Over 15 years, that devolved to place to work the wood. And then it devolved to too crowded and sloppy and messy and full of junk to even work the wood. So it became the area of our belongings that I avoided thinking about or seeing unless I had to take the trash out or unless we saw a lizard run in there. So with the advent of COVID and, and not a, a lot to do, uh, at least not like before, I decided to change the way we were using our garage and make it into what it had originally been intended to be, part garage and part uh, workshop. And at first I thought all I really would need to do is go in and pull everything out and then put everything that was in it back in it. Can you spot the flaw? <laughs> uh, on one level, everything that was in it did not need to go back in. There, there were, in fact, dead lizards and, and other things that I was personally shocked by. And there was just a bunch of junk because it became the place where I tossed stuff that I didn't know what to do with. So pulling it all out uh, uh, was fine. That was lovely. But it was not going to work to put it all back in. So I put it all back in. And I went inside and I got a glass of tea and sat down and turned on YouTube on the TV and dialed in uh, to YouTube uh, how to arrange a garage. Uh, if you don't know, that there are uh, probably about a thousand different videos on, on ways to make your garage into a workshop as well as uh, make it a place for the car. And, and then I spent the next three months building shelves and rearranging and building uh, carts with wheels for all of the various woodworking tools uh, so that I could move them around. A and also, and, and uh, I, don't, I don't think Marilyn's able to watch this morning, so this will be just between you and me when she wasn't paying attention, throwing a bunch of stuff that she didn't want me to throw away, away. And now we have at the Creel house, a garage in which sits our better car. We have a good car and uh, so the good cars in the garage and we have a wood shop that's actually usable. Can I get an amen? The moral of the story is you got to keep your eye on the prize and, and you got to go back to basics, right? If you get lost and confused and overcrowded and things aren't going well at all and you begin to feel hopeless, the best thing you can do instead of complaining bitterly or blaming somebody else is go back to the beginning and remember what it was you were going to do. So I want to say this as gently and lovingly and non-judgmentally as possible. That comes to my mind because I've spent the week watching annual conference on uh, my computer. And it occurs to me, quite honestly, that on every level of the church, we have taken our eye off the prize and forgotten who it is uh, that we're supposed to be and what it is that we're supposed to do. And I'm not just casting stones at, at our annual conference or the leadership thereof. I'm thinking about myself and I'm thinking about every church I've pastored. There is in the practice of the Christian faith, always the temptation to get distracted from the core work of the faith and, and devote yourself to things that are easier than the core work of the faith. It's easier to be popular. It's easier to be righteously indignant. It's easier to be angry and to demonize other people and consider them the enemies and have people feel good with you about that than it is to actually teach and try to live the gospel. 
So in our own backyard here, I thought today maybe we would return to the basics and remember together what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Before I get to be a big shot and point fingers and and be too critical of anybody else, I, I want to examine our own selves and think about our church, our congregation, and our personal lives as we pursue, I hope we pursue, a life that is more and more Christ-like as we grow in the faith. Uh, Matthew 23, 1 through 12 is the scripture that I have chosen. Uh, A lot of times I say everybody will have heard this, but you may not have heard this one. This is Jesus, and it's towards uh, the beginning of the end of uh, his ministry. And in this section of Matthew, he is instructing his disciples in how to be the leaders once he's gone. In other words, how to lead the church when it comes into existence. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law... And the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything that they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by other people. You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and all of you are brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will in time be exalted. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of Scripture. So let's remember together how it is that faith actually transpires, how this process of becoming a Christian and then growing in uh, to what God has planned for us works for most people. As I kind of recount the, the steps or the stages uh, in a general way, I hope that you will revisit your own faith journey, that you remember uh, before you, you really made a personal decision for Christ and, and what it's been like since, including some of the confusion that goes along with uh, trying to, to truly follow Christ. So in general, it goes like this. We are born uh, or we come into the world in some kind of stage of innocence when the truth is, in most situations, everything that we need is taken care of. We have parents, uh, sometimes older siblings, but adults bend to our will and our our want. And and in truth, life is very good then, though there's a lot of crying when (laughs) when we're babies. And as we grow, that stage of innocence might last for some people a very long time. I've talked to people who are are into their early 30s who I really believe are still in a basic state of innocence because they've not suffered any catastrophic loss and and they haven't yet been humbled by their own mistakes or by the circumstances of life. They haven't been hard pressed yet. But if you live for very long, chances are that that stage of innocence, that kind of uh, halcyon uh, time of, of your life, it, it gives way to a, a brutal reality. And, and here's the reality from a Christian mindset. What you find out is that while you thought you were in control of your life and everything in it, you never were in the first place. And it turns out other people exert a great deal of control. And that's a lousy thing to discover about life that your happiness or your peace or your ability to feel good in in this life is so dependent on other people, and many of them are unhappy and angry and acting like it. Innocence gives way then to recognition of need. Now, it it might be that other people are are, uh, taking away your innocence. It could also be, and is in many cases, that you come to an age where you recognize the temptations of the world and and you give in to them. So you chase peace or contentment or whatever it is that you would fill in the blank with through chemicals or through uh, sex or or through gambling or through success or through whatever it might be, anything but giving your life to Christ and giving your life to other folks. All of those things at some point in everyone's life 
conspire to bring us to a point when we recognize, even if only for an instant, that we need a power that is beyond ourselves. In the biblical story of the son who runs away and squanders his inheritance, the phrase they use is he, he came to himself. There in, in the uh, stalls where the pigs were slopped and, and, and fed, he came to himself and realized he had to have his father's help. And, and that does happen. It happens in everyone's life. Whether or not they become a Christian after that moment, all of us at some point will stand at the precipice uh, of our own power and our own ability to, to forge our lives, and, and we will realize that we are impotent in the face uh, of what has happened or is happening. Some people double down, and they increase their previous actions or their previous uh, mindsets, or they withdraw deeply inside themselves, and, and they become angry shells uh, uh, of what they could have been uh, because they, they play the blame game and think other people are the trouble. Other folks in that moment fundamentally reach out to God and say, help. I got to have some help. And, and what they mean is right now, right here in the ICU, I, I need some help. Here before the test is revealed here before I have to go meet my boss here before whatever it is right but before this thing breaks loose and I lose everything that I've had I need help instantaneous help if they come to church or if they're talking to a Christian during that time we hope that they will be invited to talk to God in a way that they confess their sin, they confess their own part in, in the destruction of their life, and, and they accept the forgiveness that Jesus has bought for them. And there is the first part of the discipleship of human beings that has about it a, a, a bizarre uh, tone. People come to God because they have immediate pressing problems. They've got a mess in their life that they can't clean up, and they would like help right now. Uh, so out of desperation, they turn to God. And, and when they talk to the people of God, what the people of God tell them is, great news, your sins are forgiven. Did, did you catch it? They never asked for their sins to be forgiven. They asked God to take care of their problems. So the very first major step in your discipleship, in your walk of faith, is to recognize that God, as revealed in Scripture and, and uh, as uh, exhibited by the power of the Holy Spirit through generations, understands that the biggest problem you have is not your current circumstance. It, it isn't whatever mess you find yourself in this time uh, that causes you to turn to God. Your biggest problem is you've been carrying around a load of uh, debt and sin and pain and anger and anguish, and you need to be relieved of that before anything can change. It is the truth that God is very frequently more interested in changing the whole lot of our lives than intervening in any singular situation. At that point, when people figure out, what? I, I asked for uh, mom to come through the surgery and she passed a, a, away, uh, right? So God didn't answer my prayer. And, and the church or the church people are telling me my sins are forgiven. That makes no sense to me. Many people then retire from the ark of discipleship and, and walk away disappointed because it turns out you cannot use God to do your will. Sometimes they coincide. But most often the equation goes the exact other way. It's God's intent to use you for his will. And the first sniff we get of that, right, human beings, that this thing doesn't line up so that God is the great goody machine in the sky that you just say the right thing and then you get your way, a lot of people retire. Some of them stay in the church. Some of them elevate in the church to very high positions, but they are not disciples because they still believe they can make God do what they want God to do. For those who reckon with the truth that you were created, we were created in order to be the will of God expressed, discipleship begins. And here's where the local church comes in. At that point where people understand you can ask God for anything, but what God most wants to give you is release from being in charge of your own life and the freedom that comes from being enslaved to him, you're going to have to have somebody explain that to you. 
you're going to have to have somebody who shows you what that looks like because the world is full of examples of what self-service looks like, but it's not exactly chock full of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ living for his will and, and eventually for his kingdom. You know that most people who don't go to church or, or have never gone to church or went to church and quit say about church people that we are hypocrites. Can I get an amen? You Really, you should just embrace your hypocrisy. There's no finer thing to be. I, I'm telling you the truth, right? You better be a hypocrite because you better believe that human beings are capable of, li of living much better than you do currently. That's the whole point of coming to church, right? To continue to take steps along that path and, and not to be perfected today or tomorrow, but to always be following Christ and trying to improve. We never live up. We cannot live up to the fullness of the gospel. That's never been the point. Of course, we're hypocrites. And of course, we fall short. The point is that we recognize our own hypocrisy. And in spite of it, we continue the quest. We continue to follow Christ. We continue to ask God to show us how to live better than we have. So people will point out, my goodness, right? You go to church and any church you go to, there's some really interesting folks who do not appear at all to be Christians, at least uh, after Sunday morning. And that's right. That's always going to be. Some people are further along in their sainthood than other folks, right? The church is a mixed bag. If the fact that somebody is not perfected instantaneously when they confess Christ as Lord bothers you, I promise you the problem is not that person who is a hypocrite. The problem is yours, an unrealistic understanding of how faith and life work. So the church is full of hypocrisy. Y yes, it is. A and we have to deal with that, right? We have to deal with the temptation to, to muddle ourselves in, in the lowest form of, of uh, being the church and, and, and cast our eyes on, on things that really aren't of interest to the gospel. Or conversely, a, a church, if it's about its business, keeps its house in order and does the things that a church is fundamentally supposed to do at the local church level and at the level of your individual discipleship. There are certain things that, like keeping a garage usable, right, have to be attended to and monitored and paid attention to constantly. A and they are relatively simple to understand intellectually, but oh so hard to pursue with vigor when our own egos get in the way. A local church or a denomination, the church at any level, should be a place where when you participate in it, you find yourself pushed to look at your own life through the light of the gospel and continue to understand what sin is doing to you, not what other people's sin is doing to you, not who is wrong politically, not all the stuff that we worry about, but what is your sin, the things that you give into, what is it doing to your estate of life? Every good church should give people a chance to acknowledge while they are in a loving atmosphere that we all have a long ways to go and we keep getting in our own ways. And then beyond the inducement of an opportunity to confess sins and to recognize them and to ask God to help with them, the church should be providing alternatives and antidotes to a way of life that is purely self-centered. In our own church, here are the things that we do, and we do these because of the reasons that I'm outlining today, right? Very, very intentionally so, so that we can actually be the church in, in spite of the mistakes that we make. Any church worth its salt should insist that its people have the opportunity and the strong encouragement to engage in activities person to person, human being to human being, in which they learn to be sacrificial, it used to be that churches, by and large, participated in missions by writing checks and sending them overseas to other people that they never saw. And that's a lovely thing, but it is unfulfilling. In the modern church and in our church, we strive to provide as many opportunities in the mission that we perform here we want to provide as many opportunities as we can for people to meet the people that they are providing mission or care for. 
because in doing that, in, in actually participating relationally with other human beings who are in a, a kind of need that we may not be at that time, we humanize ourselves and we enter into the spirit that Christ himself lived in where he constantly was about the business of helping those who were in need who were in front of him. So as our faith walk progresses, Christians should expect and hope that their church will give them ample opportunity to perform acts of what our church calls grace and to reflect upon them. Here's what that looks like. In grace groups, if you're not in a grace group, I, I really do wish that you would hear this part of today's sermon and, and that you would search your heart and, and make a decision to do that. So what goes on in grace groups is, is fairly simple. I have a, a non-Christian who's in my gra- one of my grace groups, <clears throat> and they're happy to be there. It, to them, it's very interesting to see what Christians say, to, to find out what's in the Bible. It's a, an interesting thing. I explained to them when they first came, I would like for you to see this as a way to test the truth of Christianity. Christians often say, you have to believe this. And, and the truth is, if you're, uh, um, well, if you're me, your reaction to anybody telling you what you have to do is always, no, I don't. No, no, I don't. So you don't have to believe anything, but Christianity is something that you can actually test and, and, and prove either false or, or true. So, so what we say is you, you go out and you do an act of grace to somebody, right? And, and, and the less you like them, the better the act of grace. Right, So in grace groups, we expect people to, to go out and to uh, grace strangers, but we also hope that they will learn to grace family members, uh, friends, and enemies, people that they don't really care for. And then the process is simple. After you do something graceful and Christ-like in the life of another person who you're sideways with, ask a simple question. Is the quality of my actual life, is my soul, is my well-being, is my peace, is what whatever word you use to describe what you're searching for, is it increased when I act in the way that Christ told me to? And the answer, as I know, is always yes. And then you can do a comparison. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, we don't really have to set this up for you. Uh, you. You've already done the opposite, right? You've already treated somebody very, very badly. Let them ha- have uh, the force of your anger or your judgment. And if you can remember the times you've done that and compare them to the times that you've been a humble servant of Christ, which one is the truth and which one brings you to the place that you most want to be? It's a simple thing. And a church that has its eye on the prize, that has its mind set, that is actually being the church and is intentional about that, had ought to be giving their people the opportunity to do that test, to make those comparisons, and to see the truth of the gospel applied in their lives over and over and over again, because that is the way that you grow. Really, it is the way that you grow. You can listen to high-level lectures and sermons on the nuances of theology. Uh, You can be made to laugh or to cry at the whim of the speaker if they're any good. You can have all kinds of emotions and thoughts as you sit in church week after week. But you can't have a full experience of Jesus Christ until you are put in a place where you're expected to act in the way Jesus told you to act, even in very dire circumstances. The truth is, a lot of the church has fallen prey to intellectualism, devoid and divorced almost completely from any kind of action, to the point where I would say the majority of Christians not only don't forgive, don't know how to forgive, and have no interest in forgiving other than the idea that they've been forgiven themselves. When that happens, when that happens in your life, when it happens in the life of a congregation, <clears throat> what happens is the place might fill up. It might be chock full of people and, and all kinds of events. You could have dances, you could have parties, you could have concerts, you could have all kinds of stuff. But none of it is producing what the church was built to produce, which is a change in the spirit and in the action of people's lives. So we do grace groups. We do food giveaways and and local mission of many kinds in the hopes that people here will take advantage uh, and understand that those things are opportunities for you to grow deeply in your faith life. And we want that because when you grow deeper in your life of faith, and your life conspires to bring you to the edge of the pit again where things are going horribly wrong and you're not getting what you want and you're just afraid of what might be coming, 
if you have been discipled and living in the faith, those things have less power than they used to have. And the prayer of the faithful changes from, oh, Lord, fix this and change it right now. I can't stand it. It can't go this way to your will be done. And whichever way it is, instruct me in how you would use me in that. And when, if you come to that point in your life of discipleship, friends, I've just described to you freedom. When the worst thing that you can imagine, the most scary and horrible circumstances that you've ever lived through is transformed because you have walked in the way of Christ because your church has discipled you intentionally and you can face it, though still with dread and fear, but you can face it knowing whichever way it goes, you're going to be okay because God will guide you. You are now free in a way that most of the world is doomed never to be. You need to study your scripture. But more than you need to study your scripture and find out what scholars say about who might have wrote it and and when and what nuance there might be in the interpretation of the word, you need to go to your scripture as a child of God, wanting your father to speak plainly to you about what you should do. Old Testament, New Testament, epistles, doesn't matter. It's clear and plain to anyone who's honest what scripture is instructing you. Marilyn and I have been uh, reading scripture in the morning for for years, um, and we cheated the last couple times in uh, Leviticus, so uh, we just skipped it. (laughs) But we decided this year, since it's COVID, what the heck, let's let's dig in and, and see. I will confess to you, this is crazy to me. I think of Leviticus as just a bunch of old laws, right? The New Testament is much different, etc. Reading one by one the prohibitions and the laws and, and trying to figure out why, why in the world uh, do they have that law? What is God doing with his people? What is the long-term plan, right? And, and uh, uh, how does that apply to my life? Is as transformative to me as any other section of Scripture has ever been. Uh, I just find that hard to even say, let alone to be experiencing, but it's true. You put your heart and your mind into Scripture with the idea that God has written you a very long and intricate love letter to instruct you and to assure you and to help you, and that love letter becomes transformative, especially if it's combined with action that is drawn from the teachings of Christ. We need to live the way that Christ taught us to live, and the church needs to provide opportunities, even though those opportunities are very hard sometimes. We need to know the Word of God, but more than that, we need to be owned by the Word of God. We just need to put ourselves in it, and and even the parts that we don't understand or seem sometimes repugnant to us, we need to let them in because they will do their work. And the last thing, and we've talked a lot about this and we'll continue to talk a lot about it, we have to replicate. You know that at one point in your life, though most of you, I think, don't remember it, you were one cell, and that cell divided to two, and those two divided to four uh, uh, until, well, for me personally, depending on uh, what I eat for dinner, I I continue to divide and and, uh, (laughs) increase. Uh, God knows how many cells there will be by the time the experiment's over. That's the nature of all life, and that is the nature of life in the Spirit. So, If you believe that you can have the fullness of God's presence in your life only by attending to the things that I've talked about so far, to forgiving and treating your enemies as well as you can and loving people and serving them through missions and studying Scripture, you're missing the single most important part of faith development. A good church and a true disciple understand No one is ever excused from sharing the faith. At some point in your life, I hope more than once, if you want to really understand how close you are to God and how dependent you are uh, uh, on God, you're going to have to sit down and try to talk to somebody who doesn't believe about Jesus Christ, about the message of salvation, and, and about what they need to do to begin the process of being discipled. You absolutely have to share the faith with your children if you have children, with your grandchildren if you have them, but also with your next-door neighbor and your boss and your enemy. You have to go out and 
the word is defend the faith, though it shouldn't be defensive. You have to, have to speak a good word for Christ and invite people into the faith in order for you to have the fullness of the faith. We are to treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. In my life, and I hope in yours too, no one has ever done anything better for me than to introduce me to Jesus Christ and to ask me the simple question, would you like to give your life to him? In our discipleship, in the road that we travel looking for peace and wholeness and whatever else, <clears throat> if that expectation isn't made clear, if the church isn't teaching how you can do that and, and how you can be uh, real and sincere in doing that, and, and if the church isn't providing opportunities, then the church is failing its people. Perhaps after you come to Saving Grace, the most important thing you'll ever do really to find out where you are in your relationship with Christ is to offer someone else what you have experienced. So the garage is together, and uh, I, I am working on a couple of projects now. The trouble with that, of course, is if your garage is messy and full of stuff, you, you can't really work on a project, <laughs> which means you can watch sports on TV, or you can play the guitar, or, or you can go for walks, or you can do any uh, lovely thing you want to, but you can't work on the project. Now the doggone thing is clean. So I'm learning to enjoy working on woodworking projects again. <laughs> That's what the garage is for anyway, isn't it? To make sure the car stays clean, and it does, and then to give me an opportunity to create stuff that I, I never would have created by watching TV or lollygagging around. This is the church. This is your walk of faith. And at some point, if you want fullness in faith, you're going to have to ask God to lead you to a place where you can do what he designed you to do, and that is to replicate and to share the faith. As we go through the next year or two in the denomination and its struggles, and as we continue to come out of COVID and see what does the church look like in, in its basic operations, my mind and my heart are on these things constantly. We are being given a chance in real time to make sure that our church is about its business, to construct our ministry and the way we are and, and what we do so that we are actually accomplishing what God created the church to accomplish. I am delighted to be in those endeavors with you, and, and I pray that you will join me in a full focus on everything that's important. I want to see if he's going to dip his wing. I'm going to assume that was heaven applauding. <laughs> So, friends, it's good to, to be with you again. We're going to continue to talk uh, uh, about all of those areas and continue to strive in the decisions we make at the local level to, to be as, as good a church as it's possible to be because we want people to experience the fullness of what God has to offer them. Amen. If you all would like to stand up and just let's just worship God in this time and allow us to ask God to just sink the, what we heard today, the word today, to sink into our hearts. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a 
child bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father, we give thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ for all that he's done through the Holy Spirit to bring us into better relationship with you. We thank you for our church and for the leaders of our church. We ask that you would bless us in our individual lives that this week as we uh, go about our living that we might do so in a way that more and more is pleasing to you. Bless us in that way and allow us the privilege of being a blessing in this community. In Christ's name. Amen.